everyone. My name is Sucheta and I am a third year PhD student in the iSchool at Syracuse University and I'm going to present um, my work that I did with Professor Jeff Sols um, within a span of a couple of years. It's uh, related to the risk management framework for data science projects. So what a timing of this presentation soon after lunch, but I would try to keep you away. <laughs> it's a pretty short and sweet presentation. So before I delve further into the project, um, let's just um, give a minute or two to understand what risk is. So let's consider a few um, situations here that may involve risk. You want to open a new restaurant. You want to open, maybe launch a gym or something. Um, you want to go for skydiving. Or let's say you want to ask for a hike or a bonus with your manager. Now, all these situations are disparate. But if you come to think of it, these situations have something in common. What do we have in common in all these situations? We have the exposure to a situation, and we have the uncertainty. In terms of the conceptualization of risk, we can say that, OK, there are three elements here that we can think of, right? First is the undesirable effects or the outcomes that may be detrimental to the humankind and the ecosystem. Second is the probability if that occurrence would happen or not, those undesirable effects would happen or not. And second, and the third is the state of reality that we have set for ourselves in a given situation. In terms of the conceptualization of risk, we can say that, OK, we have these three elements, but then these three elements stand in juxtaposition with the context we are living in. So when we define risk, depends upon where we are coming from. We might be coming from a finance sector. We might be coming from real estate. We might be coming from supply chain management. So the definition or the operationalization of risk keeps on changing. So we ask ourselves three questions here. OK, then how do we measure those uncertainties or threats or risk, right? And what are those threats? Seriously, what are those threats? And the third point would be like, how do we define the reality here. What is the concept of reality? Do we see reality with the protocols that we have set in, in industry terms? Or is it related to the project? Or is it related to the people? So you know that also requires some sort of clarity. So by and large, we can say that, all right, risk has you know, cause and effect pair here. We are talking about the threat, which is actually the cause. And then when the threat is realized, that we have the consequence or the impact. Now, we wanted to understand what are those threats in data science projects, right? So right off the bat, we could think of you know, some of the popular or you know, commonly occurring risks we see in the market. One example that we could think of was the target incident, right? The, the uh, woman shopper goes to target and um, she is pregnant, and uh, with the help of the big data predictive analysis, Target predicts that, OK, this woman is pregnant, and they send marketing material to her family residence. And uh, the woman ha had not uh, revealed this news to their family members. So with this example, we can all right gauge that there is a privacy risk. There is a reputational risk, right? And then there is a personal risk. Then we have the data consistencies. Like with the influx of structured and unstructured data in the market, we see a lot of data inconsistencies. Then we have the regulatory risk. Now we have the GDPR and the CCPA that becomes a hindrance when we have subsidiaries all across the globe if we are domiciled in the United States. And then lastly, we have the data privacy of consumers that, we, that I just touched upon. Um, could you please flip? Sorry. All right. So, OK. So we talked about risk, right? Now let's talk about the risk management framework. What do we mean by risk management framework? 
This present definition has been extracted from the articles I just went through a few days ago. But I want to talk about my definition of risk management framework. Like how do I define risk management framework? I would say that risk management framework would enable me to first identify the project risks and second of all, the measures that would help me mitigate or manage the risks. We can never really reduce the risk to zero percent, right? We can always manage it. We can always mitigate it to a certain extent. Now, these are some of uh, the bullet points or some of the international standards we have been using in the industry. Like COSO is an enterprise level uh, risk management framework. We have NIST, which is for cyber security. Then we have ISO and we have uh, COVID. So in the interest of time, I have just jotted those down. Let's move forward. And I can't move forward. What's happening? OK. So we wanted to know that, especially in the context of data science projects, do we have any standard in place? Do we have any risk management framework in place? So we did a thorough systematic literature review. With the search through six repositories and with various uh, keyword combinations, we could figure out that, OK, we are talking about the standards, all right. But those standards are, again, you know, like either generic, like enterprise level, or they are probably talking about cybersecurity, or they are pro probably talking about cloud computing, supply chain management. But there is no such standard that we can take as a motivation that would help us frame our own international, maybe, framework for the company we are working with, data for, especially for data science. So here, as you can see, the, the risk management framework, spe especially for big data science project, is zero. And that paved our way to move to the next phase of our study. Now. We wanted to go to the market. We wanted to speak to the data scientists. We wanted to know if they have to you know, share their thoughts on how they are managing the risk, how they are monitoring the risk and processing the risk elements. So we, de we developed two research questions for our study. First is, what is actually the risk management process for data scientists? And how are they deployed during the execution of the project? And the second question was that, how are these risk elements identified monitored and mitigated. So we filed for an IRB and we decided that, OK, uh, we're going to go uh, do a selective sampling, find out a few participants. As you can see that the data, uh, the sample size here is pretty diversified. Uh, we had set our criteria to only interview those participants who had more than two years of experience, especially because we wanted to actually understand, given the intricacy of risk management uh, framework and the sensitivity, to only interview people who had substantial years of experience in the industry. With the industry column, you can see that this uh, sample size is very diversified in nature. So we did not just restrict ourselves to private organization or public organization. We went to government, we went to healthcare, we went to IT, we went to management, finance, uh, manufacturing, entertainment, so on and so forth. So we had total 16 participants whom we interviewed for this study. OK, now we applied inductive analysis. We had two sets of matrix. One was the similar themes, and the second was the dissimilar themes. What we did is that we actually created bigger themes and then subsumed the smaller themes underneath it. So we essentially applied the inductive analysis approach. And these are some of the findings we could think of that helped us understand how the data science risk is actually managed by these guys. So let's just uh, take a look at the first one. ID1, the participant one, is talking about how the project management uh, is used as a skill to manage the risk. Now, ID1 is from Defense uh, Agency. And this guy, um, he says that the team works as a venture capital. Yeah, that they would gather together, they would brainstorm the questions, and then they would apply the project management uh, uh, framework to manage the risk. They have their proprietary risk management framework. Second one is talking about the seven-step success criteria. He works for a conglomerate. And he's, he's saying that they are documents heavy. They always rely upon documentation. And they have their brainstorming questions uh, to start from when they uh, think of executing a data science uh, project. 
and then so on and so forth. So we had total 16 um, risk management processes for data science project. Another theme that we could think of was to create two categories that basically encompassed, encompassed the actions that we take to identify the risk, and then second set of actions were related to how they minimize the risk, right? So as you can see that um, they were pretty much about asking questions. They always asked questions. So right at the commencement of the project, they would sit together, they would brainstorm, and that would basically pave their way to move to the next step of the project. So asking question was all, but just ID14 who did not talk about because this guy was a sales manager and they had recently, uh, you know, launched uh, the data science uh, project a few months ago. So they have this ad hoc risk management framework going on uh, their team. And then they have their own ways of minimizing risk. They talk about the project timelines, they talk about the cost risk, they talk about the opportunity risk, budget risk, so on and so forth. These are some of the quotes that I extracted through the, uh, trans, uh, the transcription. So the first guy is talking about how much they are dependent on the documentation because then they are careful and mindful of the errors that they made in the earlier projects. So the next time when they have a similar project, they would not commit the same mistakes. But still again, come to think of it, they are unaware of the unknowns. They can only document the things that they know and they can see, but they cannot write about something that they still haven't encountered yet. And that's where we, we find the need of having a framework which would create cushion for the unknowns, right? Second one is talking about the frequent discussions that they have uh, in the beginning of the project, which is again context specific because the questions cannot arrive until we know the specificity of a project. So they, those were not standard questions or gold standard. And the, one of the participants talked about the data privacy and the GDPR, like how important it is for people to understand that, okay, we have a branch, we have a legal entity of, of, of a company, but then we have subsidiaries at the other uh, uh, parts of the world. So who are we giving the access uh, to the data? Who are those people? Uh, do we have the permission? Do, are we following all the regulatory constraints? So when we talk about data science, we also have to talk about the regulations in place. Then an, another finding that we could come up with was related to the structure, right? Like uh, some of the data scientists were talking about ad hoc structure. Some of the data scientists talked about uh, a structure that was pretty much resonating the standard international uh, framework we have in place for the industry. Some were centralized, some were hybrid, and some were decentralized. These are some of the quotes I um, extracted uh, through uh, the interview analysis. They talked about when it is you know, custom framework, like they take basically bits of uh, the international standard and then they curtail it, then they customize the framework based on the requirements of the project. Then they have the centralized hierarchical framework where you know uh, the subsidiaries create some sort of child-parent relationship with the legal entity. And then they have the decentralized and the hybrid. The other finding was related to um, COVID. How um, the data scientists were transitioning through COVID. Um, initially, they were working at work, you know, like at work, they were, they were going to the office, but later on they uh, started working from home. So what were the changes they could see themselves during that transition? So one data scientist talked about uh, enrolling to various um, online courses through LinkedIn. Uh, some of them talked about the fatigue that these data scientists are facing because, you know, they are working all the time. They are not getting any breather. Some of them talked about being prolific on uh, these professional networks. They would share their own ideas and then they would get feedback from the rest of the data scientists who are a part of uh, the connection. 
So that's how they were sort of creating a collective action with each other. In terms of the limitations and the future uh, steps, um, one of the things that we figured out is the unavailability of women participants for this for the study. We, 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 we tried and uh, we contacted them, uh, but somehow it did not really work out. So my question would be, why? Why did they not participate? Was there any reason? Um, and then what I would like to ask is, how is risk perceived differently by gender? How a woman data scientist perceive risk vis-a-vis uh, -vis how a male data scientist would, right? That would be maybe uh, my future research to look at. Another limitation I would say is the small sample size. I mean, we tried to diversify it as much as possible, but well, we just had 16 participants. So uh, in terms of the future step, we would like to expand the pool. We would like to invite more and more participants who can solicit their um, opinions to us regarding the risk management framework. As a part of the future step, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to um, uh, create a survey instrument. We have now the findings in terms of the themes. We would create a list of those themes and send it to the participant and seek their advice with different scenarios. We would like to ask them that, OK, if we change the scenario a little bit, do you think that you would still resonate with the existing risk management process? If yes, then why? If no, then why? And then with those interviews, we are going to suss out the common elements and try and see if we can create a prototype of a common or enterprise level risk management framework for data science projects. And then maybe later on, we are planning to have a focus study group uh, with the data scientists. So this is pretty much it. Uh, and uh, yeah, initial findings of my study. The floor is open for question. Was so one that came in, um, yeah. and I think it's been asked to the other speakers as well, but um, what do you think are the most important skills that new data scientists, not scientists, um, should have, or if they don't have them, should work to acquire? Um, hmm. So I would actually resonate with what uh, Neeraj mentioned, that uh, a good know-how of data ethics is extremely important. Many a times, and this was one of the things that the data scientist who was a hiring manager mentioned that uh, students, uh, for the hustle that they have to get a job, would mention some of the skills as keyword on the resume so that you know those resumes are picked up by the recruiters, but at the, same, but at the time of interviewing them, they figure out, the hiring managers figure out that they just have a superficial knowledge. So I would like to say that one thing you have to keep in mind that having hundreds of keywords would not really build up or embellish your resume. Be very truthful you know, to your skills. So you have to be a little honest when you are building up your resume. Second of all, data literacy. So uh, there is a, if you actually see the domain of data scientists, you would find that there's a scarcity of right skills. Right? So data literacy is something which is extremely important. How much you speak with the data. Like skills can, can be acquired, but the main, the, game, the name of the game is to actually analyze the data. Right? That's where the um, entire gamut of data literacy comes into play. So that's, that's important. Um, what else? I think those were some of the things I would suggest. Any other question? Yeah. I'm sorry that I was late. No problem. Day to day activities of a PhD student would be uh, start with reading and end up with reading, and maybe in the middle go for a break, have a nice meal with your friends, <laughs> and be thankful and have a lot of gratitude. That's all. <laughs> And yeah, I mean, depends upon, I mean, uh, uh, 
besides this philosophical answer, depending upon the aspiration that you want to go for, it's very important for you to build up connections. Like that's how I built up connection. When I was working with Jeff, I was also at the same time looking out for internship opportunities. Although I come with uh, 12 years of experience with the industry, uh, it's actually through one of the projects I was doing that I got the internship opportunity. So that's something you need to kind of build up. Uh, depending again upon your aspiration, if you want to go to industry or if you want to go to academia, that's important. A follow-up to that question, how do you feel yourself attached to the industry as opposed to the higher education? So uh, Bruno is asking how uh, how do I keep in touch with the industry being in academia? Did I get your question right? So how do I keep in touch? I would say that for me uh, it always works out well when uh, I am in touch virtually with all my ex-managers. Like I'm still in touch with all my ex-managers back in India and even um, uh, the, uh, the connections I built up here. Uh, with Bloomberg, uh, I always try and find opportunities to collaborate with them, even if it is just a very silly little thing. But it's important to let them know that, you know, okay, you are in the game. So even like, okay, like happy Thanksgiving or happy New Year or happy birthday doesn't matter. You just need a way to like keep connect, you know, like have that sort of connection with them. So I do that. And secondly, um, there were a few informal groups like uh, abilities group, queer groups, uh, women in tech groups that I was in touch with. I was also looking out for cross-border opportunities within the company that uh, kept me connected with other teams, you know, other than my own core uh, team. So that actually expanded my network. I just try to like keep in touch. Any other question? Yeah, go on. Uh, yeah, I was uh, I was actually managing a team in Deutsche Bank prior to joining the academia. I was uh, uh, I was managing a team of four in Bombay, and what I figured out is that even though we had COSO framework in place, there was there were still loops and holes that we did not recognize. Possibly because we live in a denial, we think that okay, there is a framework, we are doing our job, so what? Like it's working out very well for us, but there is an unknown that we don't know about. And the interesting is, the thing is that these data scientists even had the same sort of mental map. They are talking about what we have right now in the present, but they are not thinking of the unforeseen unknown risk that might come over to them, right? So that became my motivation actually.